founder and CEO of the Business of Fashion and welcome to BOF Live. It's a Friday afternoon here in London and it's 9 p.m. in Bali, Indonesia, where our guest Bandana Tawari is based. Welcome, Bandana. Thank you. Um, we are here today because it is a very special day for anyone who's Indian, but also anyone who is a follower and acolyte of Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the modern Indian nation. Um, Gandhi, of course, is um, a figure whose shadow looms large over the subcontinent, but his civil disobedience movement inspired Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, amongst others, and continues to inspire the present day protests like the Extinction Rebellion and the social justice movement we're seeing in the US. Um, over the years, Gandhi's principles drew considerable attention uh, and has also got a link to the green movement that we've been seeing today. And you know, we thought today is the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and we thought it was a good opportunity to talk a little bit about what Gandhi uh, signifies for Indians and also what the fashion industry can learn from Gandhi. And probably the person I know in the world who's the most well-read on Mahatma Gandhi is Bandana Tawari. So maybe, first of all, Bandana, for, for those people who aren't familiar with Mahatma Gandhi and his work, could you talk a little bit about his personal and professional journey in a very, you know, in a nutshell, just so we can introduce his work and background to everyone? Sure, Imran. First of all, thank you, BOF, Imran, for giving me this opportunity. And let me also correct you, I'm certainly not an expert. There are Gandhian philosophers who've been working for 40 years in this field, and I'm just literally learning along the way. And uh, so I humbly tell you that I am learning, but what I've learned from Gandhi's life and what he was and how he inspired changed my life. He was a humanitarian, a human being, um, an ordinary lawyer, um, came from an ordinary family that was able to uh, afford the lifestyle for him to be a lawyer in London and then go and practice in South Africa. And he was meek, very humble, didn't have the qualities of what we would give radical activism that he ignited today in the world. And so he was so many things that I personally believe in, which is he was first humanitarian, politician, a writer, and eventually became a radical activist that eventually gave independence to India through his nonviolent means and influence politics all over the world. So in a nutshell, that is Gandhi for me. Okay, and so, you know, I, I started reading about Gandhi when I was a young boy and there were some certain kind of principles that kind of led Gandhi's life. And the, the two that kind of I really think about are Ahimsa and Satyagraha. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to us a little bit about these principles and what, what they actually mean and how they're connected to, you know, the way Gandhian, you know, philosophy is interpreted today? Sure, there's several, but the most prominent ones are, of course, ahimsa. So ahimsa means non-violence. Non-violence in thoughts, deeds, and actions. In fact, there's a wonderful quote by Gandhi, and he says, Ahimsa or nonviolence is not a garment that you put on and off at will. The seat is in the heart and it must be forever. It has to germinate, I'm paraphrasing now, it has to germinate from the depths of your soul. So ahimsa as an act of nonviolence is so fundamentally simple, but so difficult to execute when we live in a consumerist world. But if you look at the idea, what he meant was, if we as human beings do not want to harm any other, when I say any other, it doesn't mean just human beings. It could be the tree, it could be the plant, the insect. Then you believe that you are part of an ecosystem that must exist alongside you, not because you're the privileged one that has to plunder the resources of nature for the, uh, the benefit of mankind. So that's Ahimsa. 
So when, 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 when he had this philosophy of Ahimsa, how did that manifest in the way, you know, he pursued and um, kind of activated his beliefs with, with regards to the whole movement of independence in India? Can you tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, how that, what that meant in practice? Sure. Well, <clears throat> for him, Ahimsa was just the beginning of Ahimsa to get political freedom from British colonization was a, a template that we will not fight with violence to get political freedom, that there's going to be nonviolence, civil disobedience, everything that we see with modern day protesters on the streets of whether it's Manchester or Alabama, you can, you see it. People putting out their hands like this and saying, you can arrest me. I succumb to the arrest because not because I don't believe in the law, but if it is a law that is unequal, then it is my birthright to say that I do not subscribe to it. So Gandhi has been you know, influenced, I mean, there's so many different versions of it by Thoreau's work. And he, Thoreau wrote a book called Civil Disobedience. And he said, when there are laws, you have certain choices. Either you abide by them, you amend them, or you transgress them. And Thoreau transgressed them, Gandhi transgressed them because so did Nelson Mandela, so did uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. You did not want to stand for inequality. So uh, Ahimsa in that sense was, when you don't want to do a deed or accept an ideology that does not benefit everyone, it is not for just the few, but it has to be for the many. Then for him, that was the ideology behind Ahimsa. Ahimsa was a sort of an action plan. So how do we then refute a system that is inequal? The way to refute was through nonviolence, non-cooperation. That we do believe in the political systems, in the judicial systems, we do believe. But when we do not believe in the law, then it is your moral duty to stand up against what doesn't benefit the most of humanity. And that takes you to Satyagraha. Satya okay. means truth, Graha means force, the truth force. So the truth force actually calls on your moral principles. There is a moral code that you have to follow. When you are given a choice to, in any situation, you can act this way or that way. What is the choice that you're going to take? And he always said, Gandhi said, Satyagraha, which means the truth force, has to then guide you to make the choice that benefits the many, not the few. So these were not just you know, naive, esoteric uh, philosophies and notions that existed out of nowhere. He ran campaigns. He ran campaigns during British Raj in India during the, the heat of the colonization. He started something called the Salt March. And the salt march was when you're not allowed to buy the salt that you produce in your own locality, but you have to buy it from the colonizers at a higher price. So he started the salt march in Gujarat as a non-violent way of protesting, which we see today everywhere, all over the world. It's 78 people and that turned into thousands and thousands of people over hundreds and hundreds of kilometers and 60,000 people were arrested in that salt march. So these are not just ideas that sort of fizzled like, you know, a nice beer. These were templates for how to revolt, resist, repair systems that don't work for us. It's so relevant right now, given, you know, we're living in an age of protest and activism. You know, most recently, if we look at the, um, social and racial justice movement that's been, you know, circling the globe um, following the murder of George Floyd. And when you see people taking a position of nonviolent protest, of course, some of the, the marches, you know, sadly did turn violent, but, you know, all of that goes back to Gandhi, this idea of being uh, protesting, but without looking for conference, like physical confrontation. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is, how Gandhi used his garments and his clothes and what he wore is part of his 
um, protest as a part of his, uh, you know, sartorial messaging to communicate his beliefs. What, what can you tell us about, you know, how clothing and fabrics and textiles played a role in the way he pursued uh, his goals in terms of, you know, uh, decolonization, et cetera? Um, am I frozen? I think you're, I think you're, frozen. you were frozen, but you're back. We can hear you now. Can you oh, hear us? I'm back. And I, so yes. And so, to um, an essay written by Dr. Rome University. And he had an essay that says, said from Dandy to Gandhi, you know, the sartorial integrity of this man. And I thought that was very interesting. And of course, when you study that and deep dive into it, then you realize that there were three stages in Gandhi's life. One was when he was in India during British colonization where to be accepted as a educated young man in India, then you all, of course, you learned English, you were gentrified, you wanted to wear a three piece suit and emulate the, the gentleman's behavior from England. And that's exactly what Gandhi did. And then when he went to London, he was an awkward young man. He was vegetarian. His mom had made a promise, no wine, no women, no meat. That was like the three like pillars of you know, solidarity that he had to give to his mother. And he pretty much abided by most of them. But at the same time, he was learning elocution, learning how to play a Western instrument, to belong. He felt awkward to be in a place where he was vegetarian when no one was. So you see the transformation of Gandhi through his clothes, because from being, wanting to be a gentrified Westerner when you're a brown man from Indian subcontinent, by the time he goes to South Africa to practice law, he's still very gentrified, but he realizes that nothing can save him from the color of his skin. So even though he wore his three-piece suit and took the, you know, a train with his first-class ticket, he still got booted out. And so there were many stages in South Africa because he spent almost 20 years there. And there was a seminal moment when he meets a uh, laborer, because there were lots of Indians who were indentured laborers in South Africa at the time, at a time when it was extremely bigoted government that did not give Indians the right to vote, even though they lived there. And there he meets Bala Sundaram, a laborer who's been beaten black and blue. And that turns a page in his life. And then he looks at himself literally and says, I do not, I cannot identify with someone who's suffering looking like this. And that's when he gives up his Western garb and puts on the white kurta and the dhoti, which is the white sarong, and called it the morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, morning dress, as his affirmation that his journey has changed. Well, by the time he reaches India, and of course he did phenomenal stuff, like we, we need three more sessions of Zoom to like talk about this whole journey. But by the time he gets to India and throws of British colonization, he realizes the country has been looted, looted, pillaged for a hundred years. The richest country in the, at that time. It was called the crown jewel of the British empire because it was so rich, but it had been looted from ground up. The village economy had crumbled. The textile economy had crumbled. And when he saw that, he asked the country to give up the clothes that were made in England. So in short, what was happening was there was cotton being grown in India in abundance. The British would buy it at a very cheap rate because they were colonizers. They shipped it to England, to the mills of England, where maybe it was the fast fashion of those times. You know, make all those clothes, send them back to India, and the Indians had to buy them at a premium. And it killed the economy. It killed the textile economy. It killed the handloom economy. And overnight, well, that's a bit of a metaphor, but the country went into shambles. 
And so when he said to every Indian village, he said, do not buy the clothes that come from the mills of Lancaster. Do not wear it. Give that up and pick up your spinning wheel, your hand loom, and weave your own cloth, the khadi. You weave your own cloth. Khadi is a hand loom, handmade fabric. The country did that. It put the mill of in, in England, it came to a grinding halt. It disrupted the whole supply chain that had fed the British Empire from India till, of course, it led to the discourse about the independence of India. But this is what I love about Gandhi. And this is what is that when he told the whole world, when he told his whole country, so clothes made in the mills of England and pick up the spinning wheel, he realized that when he said burn the clothes, the poorest of the poor didn't have the clothes to burn. They didn't have even clothes to wear. And that's when he thought, I still don't identify with the poorest of the poor. And that's when he wore the loin cloth. He removed all his cloth, clothes and it was just the khadi loin cloth around his waist. And he was called in a very scoffing manner by Winston Churchill, the half naked fakir. And Gandhi took that as a compliment. He said, now you see, my moral fulcrum is transparent in what I wear and what I stand for. So for me, that, sartorial, that is sartorial integrity. What I wear, what you wear has to represent what you stand for. I can't hear you. Yeah, so now, Bandana, we've, we've got this foundational understanding of kind of Gandhi's philosophy and particularly his, you know, nonviolent protest uh, use of, um, you know, sim like powerful symbols like salt and cloth and cotton um, to kind of uh, get the whole Indian population to participate in this protest. From the vantage point we're at now in a fashion industry that's grappling with its impact on the planet and the people, you know, what can, what can the fashion industry today learn um, from Gandhi? You know, what are the principles? I know you've become quite an activist yourself when it comes to sustainability in the fashion industry. You know, how, how can we inform our perspectives on where fashion can go from here um, based on some Gandhian philosophy and beliefs. Right. So one of the things that Gandhi really believed in was a term that's called Swadeshi, which means self-reliance. We've seen right now that the supply chain in the fashion industry is completely broken because we are so globalized that I could be wearing a shirt which, you know, the cotton comes from Bangladesh, the embroidery is done in India, and the buttons come from China. And I could have it for $3, right? That was the height of globalization. But what we forgot was that that system was pretty <laughs> messed up. We see that now, look at what's happening in Bangladesh, that we did not empower the very places that the manufacturing hubs of the world. Most of Asia makes clothes for the Western world. Yet it was so dysfunctional that five, six big brands take away their contracts from Bangladesh and the entire country is on their knees. They're not worried about COVID, they're worried about uh, starvation. So Swadeshi is about self-reliance. How do we empower communities? Gandhi was an anarchist. He didn't believe in a centralized government. He believed in village economies. So when we look at where things are produced, manufacturing, embroideries, whatever, they're village communities. They don't, you know, they may be working in a factory, but they go back to their village, right? So Swadeshi is an act of self-reliance, which is not only an act of political independence, but it's social, economic. Um, it takes into account the role that women play in the variety of businesses. And Gandhi was built from ground up. So in your pyramid structure, it was about not top to bottom, but bottom up. 
that's how India was such a rich country because it was a village economy that had an ecosystem that worked and fed their own people first. They were locally grown, locally catered to, everything was in your backyard, and then you traded what was in excess. And that happened village after village. In fact, let me tell you, E.F. Schumacher, who is one of the biggest economists, he called Gandhi he's the people's economist because Gandhi used to be riled about you know, when India was modernizing and they want, most of the politicians wanted India to be an industrial heavyweight, Gandhi kept saying, no, focus on the villages. If the villages die, India dies. That was his quote. Um, so I feel that someone like E.F. E. Schumacher, this amazing economist, when he recognized that Gandhian politics, Gandhian economics, not politics, Gandhian economics, how do you build a stable structure? It seems so radical when you read it, but when you come from a country like where I lived, India, where I live now, Indonesia, all rural economies, most of Asia, it feels almost regressive not to think about the villages because these are not nations that are run by just two, three country, uh, two, three cities that are overpopulated. The 85, 80% of them run by villages. So Gandhi was a big proponent of that. And I am a firm believer on this grassroots level development economically, socially, in whichever way you can think of development as we do today. I can't hear you. So imagine Gandhi was alive today and he was living in the world that we're in. What do you think his reaction would be to what's happening right now? And what, you know, if he was a customer advising and kind of guiding consumers or what I like to call customers around the world in terms of the way they engage with, with this industry, what do you think he would say? What do you think he would advise? Well, on a visceral level, I think he'd be delighted because the kind of protests that are taking all over the place, especially with a much younger community of people who literally are going there and saying, you know, hands up, take me to jail. This is my act of civil disobedience, you know? I want to stand up for the rights and I'm willing to be jailed. I'm willing to be beaten up. Sometimes it gets violent, but that was a sense, what Gandhi called a sense of self-sacrifice for a higher good, right? And we see it all over the world, whether it's for LGBTQ rights, gender rights, anti-Trump, you name it, we see it all over. But in terms of economics, my God, I think he would sit down with all the technocrats who are make mon making money right now, all the philanthropists who are making money, the billionaires. I think he would sit around the table and talk about Gandhian economics. Like, what is your wealth worth if you're not going to change the plight of the common man? And that was what Gandhi was always concerned about. There was nothing that he wanted for himself, you know, and how, how, you, you, it's almost a daring move. When someone wants nothing, how do you fight that person? And Gandhi was that person. So it would be interesting for him to sit with the technocrats who are pillaging us mentally right now with, uh, in COVID times. And I wonder if he'd be able to talk about what, what E.F. Shumaka eventually said, Buddhist economy. Like, can we be compassionate in the way we make our money? How much is enough? And it's a very fundamental question. It may sound very naive coming from me sitting in a jungle who hardly earns any money. Um, what is enough? And I think Gandhi would ask very basic questions to these people. That what is it that you want? Do you want to be the change that you want to see in the world? Or do you want to change it because you want to feel powerful? That's what I think. I can't hear you. Don't you think he'd also be slightly horrified by the society that we live in that's become this kind of consumerist society with so much waste 
um, you know, leaving the globalization point and aside for a minute, it's it's even just the amount of consumption that our current economy encourages. You know, don't you think that would he would find that shocking? Because he was he was all about being like, you know, conscious consumption. You know, like really understanding the impact of what you do on the on the kind of local communities around you and on, on the world at large. And that's completely missing from the way many, many of us think about consumption today. You're absolutely right, Imran. In fact, he went to the other end of the pendulum. We couldn't possibly do what he did. When he was in South Africa, he actually built a farm. It was named after Tolstoy whom he admired and they used to exchange letters with each other. And it was about frugal living, community living, planting your own trees. In fact, when I talk to my friends during COVID times, it seems to be that's everyone's fantasy. Go live in a farm, you know, grow your own crop, pick the tomatoes from your garden, what you have in excess you give to your neighbor. In COVID times, that has become such a reality. We hear about, you know, people wanting to leave the city of London, like city of New York, and move into the like, farmlands where you can go back to being more authentic selves. And Gandhi believed in that completely. But the thing is, he and he he said this. Have I frozen? No, you're fine. Okay, we may have lost Bandana for a second. Okay, um, I'm back. I'm back. Are you I'm back? back? Are you back? Okay, great. I'm back. I'm back. So, just going back to Gandhi, for him, it was always people over products. And, you know, I speak a lot about this in a tiny little talks that I do all over. And Gandhi is a big part of why I talk about it is we, live, we are living in a system. We are living in a system where we put products over people. Not only have we done that, we've put processes right down the value chain, right? Um, and then, so we've forgotten the people, we've forgotten the purpose, uh, the process, and the worst is there is no purpose to what we are making things for. So for Gandhi, it was not processes and what's your and yeah I'm, so, I'm sorry Bandana we, we're just having a bit of a hard time hearing you Uh, Bandana, do you mind saying that again? Because we, we just lost you now, for a minute. I have to wear my glasses. I was just saying, Bandana, we, we oh. lost you for a minute um, and people can't hear you. So can I, can I ask you to just repeat what you just said? Am I back? You're back. The Indonesian <laughs> internet requires a, a reboot. Let me just put it that way. Um, oh, but think it's not a problem in London. <laughs> um, but can you just repeat what you just said right now? Yeah. So I was talking about how Gandhian, Gandhian philosophy always puts people first over everything. Okay. Um, am I there? You're, You're here. Yes. Oh, okay. So people over products. And beyond products, what are people doing? They're processes. So do we respect the process? And it's so important in the fashion world to understand that we as consumers need to know how much time it takes for anything to be made. So the idea of process is also very important. But then in my very, very, very humble opinion, with purpose, uh, sorry, with products, with people, with processes, the most important is, what is your purpose? Are we going to keep making beautiful things just for the heck of it, for beauty's sake, 
when you know that we are living in war ravaged times in every way. Like when I say war, it's a metaphorical war in every way that you can think of. So what purpose, whose life are you changing? So a product has to have much more value. The narrative has to have much more value than just saying it's a beautiful product. Who are the people making it? How is it benefiting the people who are making it? Are we giving back to the communities who are making it? How long does the process take? What purpose does that process uh, entail? Whose lives are we changing for the better? Otherwise, you know what? I don't get to buy anything. Come on, COVID times, how many things do we live with? Bare minimum, right? But how far are we away from that today, Bandana? Do you think the fashion industry is anywhere near that kind of thinking in terms of thinking about the impact on people? You know, if we keep thinking that something else, someone else is going to come and solve the problem for us, then we are doomed. But if we look at it as individual will, which Gandhi very much believed in, he talked about social change through individual will. So if each one of us were to make a certain commitment to be a better human being, a better producer, a better creator, whatever it is, it has to come from the heart. And that's why I talk about spirituality and sustainability. We can keep talking about the best innovations in the world, but if the change of heart doesn't take place, and that is a spiritual act, when you don't look at your environment that is not fed for your own good, as if humankind is the only species that lives in this world, then we are doomed. And, you know, I think this is one of the TED Talks I remember. It says, if all the insects in the world um, die in the next 500 years, human beings die. But if every human being in the next 500 years die, nature will flourish. So we are just a tiny speck in this cosmic cycle and our egos are so uh, bedazzled by So where do we make that change? If you're talking about ego, you're talking about I, me, myself. So can we look at sustainability as an act that is spiritual? That means I'm interconnected human being. I'm integral to a cosmic cycle that has the bees, the birds, the planets, the stars. I mean, I love quantum mechanics and I love talking about space and space, you know, and and us at a molecular level. And we are, as my favorite uh, cosmologist Carl Sagan said, we are stardust. We're made of the same elements, the planets, the stars, the wood in my backyard, the table right where I'm standing. We're all made of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, <laughs> oxygen. It's the same elements. So we are stardust. How can we not think that environmental healthiness, environmental belief, and what we should fight for should not be a spiritual act. It has to be an individual affirmation. Otherwise, you know what? There's going to be no collective change. Then we'll always wait for someone to tell us what to do. Please, let's take personal ownership. Okay, Bandana, we, we have some questions that have come through that I wanted to turn to before we run out of time. Um, the first question is from Shilpa in the UK. So let's just bring Shilpa up and hopefully the connection doesn't destabilize. And if it does, then I'll just ask Shilpa's question for her. So let's just see if we can get Shilpa. Don't here. blame it on Bali. <laughs> There's Shilpa. Hello, Shilpa. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me on to ask my question. I love How are you? I love all those spools of thread behind you. Welcome to our studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's been an amazing talk so far. I absolutely resonate with so much that you're saying. And my question is that, do you have any advice for a small independent grassroots brands? That's what I am. Um, just about how we can make deeper and greater impact because of course, consumerism and capitalism and larger corporations hold the dominant um, space in the fashion industry and how do we impact, like how do we have greater impact with a small brand? Uh, this is one of my favorite questions because I am the biggest supporter of 
homegrown brands, right? I feel they're authentic because when you start small, you plant the seeds of sustainability at the beginning. So when you grow, your sustainable practices incrementally grow with your brand. And let's not forget, the consumerist fallacy of bigger is better is regressive. You don't have to be the biggest brand in the world. Create your tribe who, who enjoy and participate and honor your ethics as you honor theirs. Yeah. So this is about, we don't have to be everything for everyone. We've been living in a globalized and a homogenous world where everyone has to have a pair of jeans, a hoodie, the t-shirt that is made and continents away from us. And we don't give a damn about how the people who are making it are looked after. So you take control of your environment, create and be inspired in your backyard, use local resources, create a community that will value your products, pay, pay more for your products because it's made with authenticity, with emotion, with love for nature and the environment. So what is bigger is better is, I, I find that so debilitating. You need to find depth, not the width. And I think you can be successful with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shilpa. Our next question comes from Veronica. So we're gonna to try to bring Veronica up on the stage. Yes, makes absolute sense. Yeah, really resonate. Thank you. So Shilpa's gone and now we're waiting for Veronica. Hi. Uh, hi, Veronica. We can hi. barely see your face. There you are. Hi, thank you. How so are you? Thank you for a super interesting talk. Thank you, Bandana. Thank um, you. In speaking up on what you were saying about self-reliance, um, picking up on this idea, during the pandemic, people kind of started to do their own, to make their own clothes because they couldn't rely on supply, they couldn't go out and buy clothes. So people started to make clothes and, and um, mask and etc. And what do you think about these DIY ideas that kind of emerged during the pandemic, like remaking, recycling, and repurposing clothes. And uh, how can we make the consumer to understand how much power they have and how many tools they have if they can, um, if they can approach um, cloth in this way, if they realize that they have the power and they realize that they can actually work with clothes and they don't have to throw them out on, or they don't have to rely on fast fashion, but can actually produce clothes themselves or remain use them, repurpose them. That? And how do you think can we make it on a larger scale? How can we teach people to rely on themselves rather than fast fashion? Well, I'm certainly not the manufacturer, I'm not the expert, um, but as an observer in the fashion industry, there's no doubt, and I think BOF has done a whole bunch of stories that says that uh, secondhand clothing, for instance, is going to be bigger than fast fashion by 2030, Imran, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I love the idea of DIY, but let's also not forget the idea is that we will continue to buy because we're human beings, we're aesthetes, we want beautiful things. We want to buy things that are made by creative people. But the idea is not to buy so much. There is no need for us to have so much, to be suffocated by the stuff that we buy, right? Um, and therefore, so if we can buy things of value, which is amazing, appreciate the creativity of designers, which also supports millions of jobs all over the world, especially from my part of the world, and they need it, trust me, which is great. But at the same time, if we can have an attitude of repair, rewear, um, and encourage people to make that a part of the discipline of if you go and buy a new thing, you can also mend an old thing. I think that's a great combination. We don't want to negate one for the other, but they can certainly coexist. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Veronica, for your question. 
Thank you, we, have, we have time for one more question and I'm going to see if we can get Matthew Mark Horn uh, up on stage um, who has some interesting observations on the conversation. Hi, can you Hello. see me? Yeah, hi, Matthew. How are you? Hey, Imran, this is a really great um, conversation. So thank you for hosting this. No problem. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Where are you today, Ma Ma Mark? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm at home in my little home office in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, great. Well, well, I don't know if we've had someone from Baltimore on a, on a BOF live before. So welcome. W what's your question for Bandana? Well, so two things. Um, one is, you know, when we talk about Gandhi and the spirit of Gandhi, um, his selflessness, his journey, you know, going from a barrister where he wore, you know, suits made at Savile Row to the dhoti. Um, I really believe that we, are, we embody Gandhi today. If you look at, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, my background's in international law, but I do a lot of work combating uh, modern day slavery and human trafficking, right? If we're mindful of the supply chains and we look to see about debt bondage, I mean, so Gandhi's philosophy, I think, you know, when Pavel talks about, you know, in his work and he stands up for human rights and human dignity, I mean, I think Gandhi is everywhere in the business, but more importantly, or just as important, we need to look at the financial side of this. And, and, and this is how I come to look at it. it, you know, in addition to the compliance law supply chain stuff, is that when you have caring and you have LVMH and you have these you know, huge brands that are financed by you know, the private equity firms, if you look at, and I urge you to do it, I know your background, Imran, you probably saw it, but Larry thinks, um, letter to his board and investors about how he's only going to focus on ESG and sustainability and any of his, any of his investments. I mean, we're, you know, we can get rid of the H and M's, but the huge, you know, Inditex. What we need to do, and in, in the spirit of Gandhi, which I truly believe lives on, is we need to continue to educate the big firms and have them sign on to the sustainable development goals and, si and sign on to the FAST uh, Act against you know, combating human trafficking and modern day slavery. I mean, I think, I think uh, this was an exceptional topic and it, it's, it's beyond you know, the, the smaller um, sustainable you know, developing businesses. I think we have a real opportunity uh, on the larger scale, you know, to, to, to come together as a community as we did with COVID, as, as we did with the common fund or, you know, the common thread, excuse me, I'm looking yeah. at the bracelet I'm wearing. Yeah. So I, I really think this is an opportunity to reflect and understand what Gandhi's already brought. So Bandana, and, what are your thoughts? Bandana, let me just interrupt there for a sec because I, I think the question in there uh, Matthew is like, well, how do these philosophies, we've talked about how they apply to like smaller businesses and, you know, individuals, but what do you think big organizations like some of the big conglomerates, luxury conglomerates, or the big fast fashion companies, what, what can they learn from Gandhi, Bandana? Yeah. And how do we teach them? How do we educate them in these principles to make the world a better place? People above profits, you can do both. You can do both. Of course you can do both. And you need to do both because you want people to rise out of poverty. And so we, at the one hand, need to be consumers to, in, to, be in, to enable people to come out and do what they have to do to earn their living. I think what I say about Gandhi, for instance, is so fundamentally simple. I almost feel naive when I talk about it. So when, when Gandhi talks about Satyagraha, and I'm going back to what we already talked about, Satyagraha, truth force. 
We don't have people sitting in conference rooms talking about a philosophical way and an, a humanitarian way of making profits because you look at people as products. We know we are data mined. Today, I am the product. You are the product. So we are living in a world like that. So the Gandhian philosophy that says, go against that. People matter. Human beings matter. So Satyagraha is actually invoking the very core of your belief, your moral fulcrum. What do you do when you're in a situation where you can go left or right? I'm not talking politically in terms of that. And let me, let me I know we don't have too much time, but this is what I learned from writing for Paro, which is a website that I write for, which is an old Vedantic, old Indian philosophies and is very secular. And Gandhi, what he talks about, I can put it in two terms that is probably tattooed in everyone's arms. Every hippie has it on their arm. It's dharma and karma. And let me tell you, I'm talking about secular terms, not religious terms, okay? Dharma, that's your moral code. Which CEO is sitting there in a, in a conference room talking about what is my moral code? They're not. They need to revisit fucking history. It kills me. They need to revisit philosophy and ideology. So there is dharma. That is your moral code. And what moral code that you choose to live by is going to define your karma, the causation. Okay? So it's a very simple graph. How I work within this environment as a person that benefits others as opposed to be detrimental to the others is going to define what my karma, how I'm going to live forward is going to be. These are fundamental principles that existed thousands of years ago. And so Gandhi believed in that. And we should. I think it's a paucity of philosophical debate, philosophical understanding, ideological upliftment that we lack in today's day and age. We are all about consumer, it's about things and products, not people, not ideas. We evolved through millions of years because of these amazing ideas. And yet we've regressed to become, uh, you know, products. No wonder we are sold. No wonder the technocrats are having a field day and running to the bank because of mere data. So let's go back to philosophy. Let's go back to ideology. Let's believe in dharma. What is your moral compass in the world? Who are you going to help? And are you going to be daring enough to help and protest against a system that doesn't benefit many, just a few? And that's a Gandhian way of thinking. Okay, well, on that note, um, I'm afraid I need to wrap things up. Thank you, Matthew, for your question. Uh, Bandana, it's always great to connect with you and hear you talk about things you're passionate about. I wanted to apologize for everyone for the poor connection I know it made um, some of today's conversation a bit hard uh, to understand, but hopefully the core messages came through. And I think Bandana's um, treatise this just now on Dharma and Karma is a good way to end. So um, I, I wish you a good night, Bandana, in Bali. And um, thank you to everyone for joining um, from all around the world. Uh, and uh, happy birthday to Mr. Mahatma Gandhi. Um, who is hey, happy everyone. birthday, Gandhi. Okay, yes, <laughs> indeed. All right. Have a lovely evening, Bandana. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.